Hi, ho everybody. My name is Patrick McKenzie, better known as Patty11 on the internet. So Christoph mentioned that in his local time zone, it's about midnight. I was born in central time zone, but my body is on JST, Japan Standard Time, where it is about 9 a.m., I think, in the morning. So my body is sending my brain signals like you have just pulled an all-nighter. As a former Japanese salaryman, I have substantial experience with all-nighters. They produce, um, and this is true, you can like look up the research, they produce a... Uh, a physiological res uh, response in you which resembles being drunk. You have lowered inhibitions and you make poor decisions. B2W engineering managers in the room remember that when you're telling the team to kill themselves late at night. Anyhow, so uh, in the spirit of really poor decisions, I thought I would bring my uh, own intro music here. And you might think, looking at me, oh, it's surely going to be white and nerdy. And you were right. Um, <laughs> But Weird Al's like, licensing people uh, didn't get back to me in time, so instead I pulled something with an appropriate license for an open source conference. So with apologies to Jonathan Col uh, Colton, Code Monkey. Code Monkey, get up, get coffee. Code Monkey, go to job. Code Monkey, get, have boring meeting with boring manager Rob. Rob said Code Monkey, very diligent, but his output stinks. His code not functional or elegant. What do Code Monkey think? Code Monkey think maybe manager wanna write goddamn login page himself. Code Monkey not say it out loud. Code Monkey not crazy. Just proud. Code Monkey needs to die in a fire. That's not actually how the song ends. But I think that Code Monkey is not really a person. It's a mask that we don, an identity we choose for ourselves and something which is really, really against our interests in the long run. We heard in an earlier speech someone uh, say that we tend to outsource the understanding of marketing and sales and management to the folks above us in our organizations, and then they get most of the wealth that we create with our uh, skills in building Ruby or what have you. And I think outsource is not exactly the right word there, because outsource suggests that it was at least a considered action. I think we end up ad abdicating it. We think that marketing and sales is just the... Uh, output of uh, uh, Bob, Rob, yeah, Rob, uh, Rob here, that it's something that we could never learn to do, and since we could never learn to do it, we tend to devalue it. I think that's one of the biggest problems I see in the developer community, so I want to talk to you guys about how you can do marketing and sales in a way that doesn't require you to contravene your values, will allow you to do the best possible work, and uh, not uh, turn into the boring manager Rob here and also maybe gain a little degree of respect for the uh, sales folks, the marketing folks, and management, because they actually do bring a lot to the table. So let's talk about killing your inner code monkey. I'm going to talk a lot about money in the upcoming slides, but you should understand that when I'm talking about money, I'm just really using it as a shortcut to save value. You, the reason we want to all optimize our careers is not just to make uh, piles of fat stacks of cash. If you want to do that, you can go to Silicon Valley. I hear they're hiring. But um, we want to achieve what really matters to us. And for me, for example, what really matters is that I have lots of time to spend with my family, with my wonderful wife, Rudico, with our daughter, Lillian, who just turned one year old. Time to spend with my community, coming out uh, across the world to talk in front of you guys. And uh, uh, time to learn things. So picked up a new language recently, Go. It's awesome. Um, uh, continuing to, uh, uh, to become a better Rubyist and to hopefully uh, uh, become better at all the other stuff that I do as the CEO of a company. So uh, here is the uh, FizzBuzz proof that I've actually coded Ruby before. Um, my first business was called Bingo Card Creator, and this is the beating heart of Bingo Card Creator back here because we didn't have array shuffle back then in the mists of prehistory. This will shuffle an array. Um, Bingo Card Creator was described by one of my friends as hello world with uh, attached to a random number generator, which is totally true, and uh, it sold $300,000 basically based on that four-line method. So here's the quick arc of my career. Uh, back, by the way, back in the mist of prehistory, I had a different job. Uh, before I got into entrepreneurship, it was running a World of Warcraft guild. So I totally got that World of Warcraft uh, reference earlier. It's my only management experience uh, up until being CEO of the company. So I did Bingo Card Creator for a few years. Uh, I was the sole developer and I had to figure out this marketing and sales thing because there was no one else to do it for me. And I got pretty decent at marketing and selling software over the internet. And it turns out that that is a fantastically uh, useful skill set if you're not applying it to bingo cards for elementary school teachers. Uh, so other companies would come to me and say, hey, you seem to know a little bit about that. Why don't you help us out with it? 
Joel Spolsky memorably phrased it as, you seem to be a guru-level uh, expert in things like SEO and email marketing. It's a shame you applied to a product which is totally bullshit. Uh, so I ended up working as a consultant under this Kalzumius thing, named after a dragon in an RPG campaign in high school, because that's how I roll. And uh, yeah, I did consulting for a few years, got pretty decent at it. Um, and then ran a new SaaS business called Appointment Reminder, which was the biggest mistake in my professional career. Uh, the reason why is I was never really um, enthusiastic about doing the business at all. I should have uh, done something that passed what we call the Peldy test, uh, Peldy being the gentleman behind Balsamic. When I told him I was going to do Appointment Reminder, he said, uh, do you really want to be optimizing the schedules of dentist offices for the next five years of your life? And I told him, oh, God, no. But it's a great business, right? And he's like, no, no, no. If you're going to spend the next five years of your life on it, spend the next five years of your life doing something you'd actually enjoy. And uh, tragically, I ignored Peldy's advice. Here we are five years later. I actually have something I enjoy now. Hey, uh, it's called Starfighter. We might talk about that in a little in a minute. But let's talk a little bit less about me and more about, um, well, you guys and uh, somebody who I'd like you to, to introduce you to. This is my lawyer, his name is George Grellis. Um, I was originally going to replace this slide with like stock art of a business guy, and then I realized I knew someone who actually looked like, well, stock art of a business guy. Um, <laughs> you are much more like George than uh, you think. And I want to uh, talk about my first professional engagement with George recently as we were spinning up the company. So I went to George and said, uh, now me being a uh, boring manager, Rob here, who knows absolutely nothing about legal anything, I say, George, I have a wonderful idea. We're going to hire me as an independent contractor of the new company. So I will be the independent contractor CEO. And George says, that's interesting. Why do you want to do that? Now, note that George could have said, that is a really terrible idea. You suck at this. Um, which might be the engineering response to like boring manager Rob saying, hey, I heard about this like new database that you should totally be using. It's called NoSQL. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, George said, no, I want to understand the business rationale for this. You had some reason you wanted to do that. What was it? And I said, well, uh, my personal tax situation in Japan is complicated. I think that decomplicates it. He's like, okay, I hear you. That won't actually work. What you have to do is set up a Japanese Kabushiki Gaisha, which is a subsidiary of the American corporation. You put yourself on the books as a W-2 employee or the local equivalent in Japan of the Japanese Kabushiki Gaisha. Then you, uh, you own one-third of the American dis uh, corporation and take distributions to it. That minimizes your tax burden and uh, tax planning burden while actually being legal and won't get you investigated by the IRS or thrown in jail. And I was like, wow, George really knows his stuff. And if I had proceeded on my, well, that's great, George, but I'm... Uh, I'm going to totally ignore your advice and get thrown in jail. George would have said, no, I'm the professional in the room. I know my stuff. You trust me to do this for you. And so you're going to trust my advice. And I think George is very good at this. Uh, he exudes professionalism when he gets into a room. It's like, I'm, uh, he has literally been doing what he does as a job for longer than I have been alive. It's like, I know virtually everything there is to know about this subject. You brought me in because I am the best. I will give you the best advice, and you will implement the best advice. And George very rarely has that problem that a lot of us had in our consulting days where like, we kill ourselves for two weeks or six months, as the case may be, like building something. And management is like, that's great. Throw it in the trash can, but thanks for your effort, and I may or may not pay your invoice. Um, lawyers are very good at getting their invoices paid. So I'm going to talk a lot about business in this presentation, but I think uh, all the W-2 employees in the room, or local equivalents in whatever your country might be, should think of yourselves as businesses. And you have a lot of functions in your life which resemble being a business. For example, uh, you've all done enterprise sales before, except you didn't know you were doing it at the time, when you were having a job interview and you said, hey, um, I think we can agree on me swapping my uh, services from me, LLC, uh, to build Ruby on Rails apps for your corporation, and it will cost you X amount a year. That's enterprise sales, really all it is. Um, you probably quoted a salary that was a little lower than that, but the total cost of ownership was 120 k a year. Total cost of ownership is one of the words that they like teach you when you get your CEO ring. Anyhow, um, you've all done marketing before. You just call it Twitter, GitHub, OSS contribution, et cetera. You've all done financial uh, planning like a CFO does, except uh, you thought you were just buying tickets to this event. We're hoping that I give you a little bit of tactical advice, which will make this have a positive ROI for you. That's another CEO word. Uh, positive ROI for you so you can come back next year. So the most important advice I've ever given anyone, and I get put it in all my presentations for a reason, is charge more. Charge more, 
charge more, charge more, charge more. Most developers have huge mental hangups over this. And uh, I know that just saying, okay, this is a mental battle, you need to understand that you're worth it to charge more, is not really actionable advice, so I want to break it down for you into like really easy, concrete steps on how you go about charging more in your services business, for the SaaS software you happen to run, or when you're doing your next negotiation. So here it is. Oh, whoops, <laughs> one slide off. Why do you want to charge more? Uh, well, A, make more money, that's always nice. But you're going to find that as you charge more, uh, people bracket you into an entirely different class of whatever it is you do than uh, you were when you were the cheap option. You'll find that they listen to your advice more, that your projects actually get implemented, that you're allowed to make uh, the creative decision making to do your best possible work. That you will even do better work because you'll be more motivated to do the better work, and that um, your better work actually gets implemented. So back when I was a Japanese salary man and making roughly $30,000 a year, Probably 80% of my professional output got shelved the day I delivered it and never seen by anyone. And this is me doing 100 hours a week of work on this stuff, killing, my, killing myself, and then it never mattered to anyone. Um, when I was doing consulting engagements and my final rack rate was, and this is not to brag, but this is just demonstrative of what happens after you understand value and positioning. Um, final rack weight, rate was $30,000 a week. And um, when you're charging $30,000 a week, they very rarely make you like work for three weeks and say, okay, well, that's nice, and then throw it immediately in the garbage bin, which happened to me all the time when I was the cheap option. So how do you charge more? Instead of saying a small number, say a big number. <laughs> okay, that might not have actually been like super actionable, so let's start with some stuff which is more actionable. So, uh, one moment. You generally want to have two rates and only two. Your full rack rate, which is whatever you think you can get at, as the market, market clearing rate for your position. So for me, back in the last days of my consultancy, that would have been uh, $30,000 a week, and then free. You want nothing in between those two extremes. Why? Hmm. I find that a lot of people create excuses for themselves on why they are not worth the full rate or why this particular deal is worth giving a discount for. You don't want to give discounts. Um, that will corrupt your decision-making process and it will corrupt your client's decision-making process. For example, my church has a website that was made in 1996 and it's exactly as good as you think it is. And uh, they asked me, hey Patrick, you're in this web business, can you make us a better website? I'm like, oh, of course I could do that for my church. And then I thought, oh, well, I don't want to stick them with the uh, big capitalist price number. I will stick them with some much smaller number. And uh, that would have been a really poor decision if I had gone through with it. Here's why. Let's say I offer to do it for $500 a week, which is like absurdly below cost, but that's probably uh, the maximum they can afford in their budget. It would inevitably get prioritized, uh, prioritized to the last thing that I did every day. I'd feel insulted by doing it. I would probably not deliver my highest and best work. My church would not get the, uh, the best web page they could possibly get for that amount of money. And uh, uh, it would corrupt my own reasoning on why I was doing that engagement. What you would want to do is do an engagement at your full rate for whoever will pay your full rate. And then if you want to donate money, just donate money. And then that forces you to, uh, to confront the fact that, okay, I'm really donating like $29,500 of value uh, for doing a web, web, page for, uh, web page for my church. Is that my like, highest and best use of resources? So I want you to negotiate only on scope and never on rate, particularly for the service providers in the room. So that means that when a client comes back to you and says, oh, your proposal had a number on it, let's say that number was, I don't know, $15,000. We only have $10,000 in the budget. You don't say, and mostly, most of the time you don't say, okay, uh, we just won't do the engagement then. Uh, and you don't say, okay, oh, that's a, that's a one-third cut on my rate, but I need to pay rent this month, so I'll do it. Uh, you never do that because you will never get that rate concession back with that client, and it will complicate your business dealings uh, with every other client in the future. Instead, what you say is, okay, if the budget is $10,000, I think we have a few options going forward. One of them is simple. What do you want me to cut? And that gives clients something that they want even more than money. It gives them the feeling of agency. We talked a little about, a bit about agency earlier. Sometimes they just, the only thing they want out of that discussion is to feel like they're not getting terms dictated to. So you say, okay, 
I'm the trusted provider of the service, uh, producing Ruby on Rails applications which actually work, but you are the trusted provider of knowledge about your business situation. Tell me what in your business situation is most important to you. That will get done within your budget. And the little frilly stuff on the side, that uh, we just won't do that little frilly stuff on the side. Or tell me a little bit about your internal decision-making process. Where did that $10,000 number come from? How do you do budgeting? Is it something that could potentially be increased if we made the right business case to the right people at the company? If so, let me help you do that. So, uh, you want to use internal anchors for pricing. What does an internal anchor mean? Well, let's say you had never heard about like um, my consultancy, for example, and I threw out the number, yeah, um, my rack rate is $30,000 a week. You would say, oh my god, that's expensive. And you would immediately go, uh, uh, you know, try um, anchoring it, which means just comparing that number to other numbers you've heard for developer services over the years. Like, well, I paid that guy $60 an hour one time, multiplied by 40 is a hell of a lot less than uh, $30,000. Oh my God, what are you even thinking? So I would never want clients to uh, compare, uh, compare numbers that I was quoting against numbers that other people had quoted to them for services that were, frankly, not comparable. Instead, I would give cl uh, clients a few options of things, like, okay, um, let's say we have X, Y, and Z possible that we can do an engagement, and here are my estimates on how many days that th those will take. If you wanted to get everything done, that'll take about three weeks, which would be three times 30 is 90. If, um, if X and Y are really important to the business, but Z maybe not so much, then we can get this done in two weeks, which is, by the way, what most of my clients choose to do, and then that would be only 60. And then if uh, we just want to dip our toes in the water and get started with working together, we can uh, do an initial assessment in one week, which would be 30 which sounds best for you. And then they don't say $60,000 is a hell of a lot more money than 60 times 80. They'll, they'll say, oh, $60,000 is the middle of the road safe option, and they'll take it. So um, uh, if you're doing like a SaaS business or something, that's why virtually every SaaS uh, business is priced on like the three plan pricing grid. You get to say, okay, don't look at our competitors to determine what the service is worth. We're going to, we're going to tell you, if you're an enterprise, it's worth 500 bucks a month. If you're a small business, it's worth, I don't know, 90, $99 a month. And the starter package is available at $49. And then you're comparing 49 and 99 rather than say, okay, I'm comparing the $99 to, well, it includes one gigabyte of storage. What does one gigabyte cost on Amazon? Oh my God, that's expensive. You never want to have uh, that going through your customers' minds. Also, recurring revenue is the best, best, best kind of revenue. There's fundamentally only a few ways to make more revenue in a business. One is to sell to more customers. Uh, one is to charge your customers more. And the other one is keeping your existing set of customers, just sell to them at a higher frequency. So for all of you folks who are pitching the most common deal in Ruby on Rails uh, consulting, which is I'm going to make an application for you. It'll take X amount of time. I deliver that ac uh, application, and then we're done until we do another application. You want to start building things in like, hey, uh, I've been in the software game for a while. I'm your trusted advisor in software. And I will tell you, every software project in the history of ever was not exactly what the customer wanted the day they got it. Your team is going to start using it in their daily workflow, It'll, uh, and we're going to discover things about uh, how it isn't exactly optimal for you. And what happens in every uh, software engagement in the history of ever is the client comes back and says, this isn't exactly right, can you slot me in for another engagement to fix it? And I say, yes, and that will cost exactly as much as the software it did to produce the first time. And I don't want to do that to you. Instead, I want to pitch you on a retainer agreement where you agreed to buy one day of my uh, availability every month at a slight discount to my rates. So maybe 90% of what your day rate would uh, uh, annualize up to. Day rate annualized. I'm, I'm sorry, I've lived in Japan for the last 10 years. My English is not so great. Um, whatever. Uh, the fraction that would be at your day rate. And uh, you say, it's use it or lose it. If in a given month you want to have a small enhancement to something, maybe the app needs to send more emails, maybe we need to work, rework a workflow to uh, match what your team expects, we can do that. If there's a hair on fire emergency like Heartbleed or um, you know another security vulnerability found in Ruby on Rails, rather than like uh, being in total scramble mode to find the one Rails guy who has availability that week when the entire internet is on fire, I will totally jump on that hand grenade for you because you are one of my uh, most priority clients if you have a uh, recurring arrangement with me. What, why you do this is if you sell, say, three clients on a recurring arrangement like that, you've got basically your first week of uh, work booked every month uh, as of the first day of that month, and that uh, lets you not scramble in the feast or famine consulting life cycle, but rather be able to say, okay, I know I'm going to be able to make my rent this month. I'm going to be able to pay the core business expenses. 
So I can be a little bit aggressive this month on putting out proposals, not to any client I think will say yes to them, but only the best possible clients, charging my best possible rate, doing the work that I think is going to be my best possible work. And um, you can kind of walk up the sophistication of your business doing that because you have the freedom and security afforded to you by a bit of recurring revenue. So let's talk a little bit about marketing and sales for developers. And I know because I've been uh, doing this shtick for basically my entire career, well, after the World of Warcraft thing, um, that there's a lot of developers who are like marketing and sales, ew. Um, and I want to impress upon you that sales is really not, you know, some scummy thing that car dealers do to unsuspecting people who come into a car dealership. Uh, there's this guy, you can find him on the internet by Googling for potato peeler guy. And he does a performance, and it is that, exactly that, a performance. He sell, uh, this gentleman, uh, his name is John, he passed away a few years ago. But prior to that, he sold potato peelers on the streets of New York City. And he would just take a bunch of potatoes, carrots in the case of this photo, and peel them in front of you with his uh, potato peelers. And while he was peeling it, he was saying, if you have a good, sharp potato peeler, I could, uh, you can uh, cut your vegetables uh, thinner. That means they'll soak up more juice. This is a uh, feature proposition to the cust uh, customer. You'll be able to make uh, uh, the best French fries you've ever had in your life, just like your grandmother made. None of that McDonald's garbage, which is, uh, which is hardening your arteries. Again, a feature, uh, feature and benefit here. And uh, it will only cost you $5 for this potato peeler. And I know what you're thinking. Why would I pay $5 for a potato peeler when I can go to the grocery store and get one for a dollar? He's predicting a customer, um, what's the word? Objection, thank you. English. Uh, he's predicting an objection and answering it, and here's how he answers it. He says, well, this potato peeler is made in Switzerland, and no one ever went uh, with uh, Switzerland because it was the cheap option. They go, with it for, uh, they go with Swiss things because Swiss means quality. This will be the last potato peeler you ever buy in your life. All you have to do is take care of it, means uh, rinse it off, and then wipe off the water so, uh, so that it doesn't rust. Even though it's stainless steel, you always want to make sure to wipe it. If you do, you will be able to give this potato peeler to your children. And he sold a lot of potato peelers. Um, literally, uh, this gentleman was uh, selling more than $1 million of potato peelers a year, $5 a pop. Just, yeah. Um, and so that impresses me. Not so much of the number, but watch this performance on YouTube. There's several people who just uh, captured him with an iPhone over the years. He very clearly loves potato peelers, loves selling them to people. And his eyes like vibrate with, with hey, I'm not a sleazy sales guy. I really care about cooking. I really care about giving this, this nice little performance, which is itself a little bit of street art that you might enjoy. And in return for that, if you need a potato peeler, I have the best potato peeler in New York City right here for five bucks, or $20 for five of them, um, which is a great option to upsell people. Anyhow, let's talk a little bit about market research. And this is especially for those of you folks who are thinking of going to business for yourself but don't exactly have an offering in the market already. Uh, so the process basically looks like this, and you can read it for yourself, I won't read it for you. I'll instead give you an anecdote of how I did it for appointment reminder, which while being a business I shouldn't have been in, I think I did a decent job of this. Um, appointment reminder made uh, appointment reminding phone calls, SMS messages, and emails to the clients of professional services businesses. The, um, sorry, I've memorized that and said it about a thousand times over the last five years while hating it every time. Anyhow, uh, so I thought, is anyone going to buy this if I make it? Should I spend eight months building software and then show people the demo and ask them to buy? No. Instead, I'll go to Chicago, where I'm from originally, take out a few hundred bucks from the ATM, and go into every massage therapist and salon that I could find in a nice Tony section of Chicago where I thought I wouldn't get mugged. And uh, I would say, hey, uh, are you the business owner? And if they said yes, I said, do you take walk-ins? And if they said yes, I said, okay, I have a proposition for you. Um, I'll pay for whatever 30 minutes of the service normally costs, but instead of getting my hair cut or getting a shoulder massage for 30 minutes, I'd just like to talk to you about massage therapy for 30 minutes because I'm interested in the industry. And I would talk, uh, talk to them a little bit about, okay, tell me what you do here for scheduling. Uh, do you do scheduling on a computer? Do you have software for that? Do you do it in a book uh, full of paper? What percentage of your, of your clients come in through appointments versus what percent come in as walk-ins? Do you have a no-show problem in your appointments? Do you call people regarding the no-show problem? What have your experiences been like that? And the thing that I heard from a lot of people was that, oh, yeah, we have a no-show problem. We don't call people. Uh, the best quote I got from a massage therapist, if my hands are on a telephone, they're not on someone's back. If they're not on someone's back, I'm not getting paid. So, no, I don't spend two hours every morning calling people. And I said, what if there were a computer that could do that for you? Would you pay 
$30 a month for it. And of the people I talked to that day, uh, I got thrown out of exactly no places. Um, only one person actually accepted money for the talk, even though I was offering it up front. They all said, no, this is just an uh, opportunity to talk to someone about a subject that I'm passionate about. That's why I run this business. Um, but uh, So at the end of that day, 15 people said, yes, once you've built this, I will buy it for 30 bucks a month. That sounds great. And then I promptly lost their email addresses. But um, it's not really like... You know, 15 times 30, not a motivational amount of money every month, but knowing that, okay, I was just able to talk to people and get them to agree to say yes. It's it, One thing that you can do, particularly if you're dealing with more sophisticated businesses, is to not just to get them to agree to say yes, because like we heard in an earlier presentation, you can get people to agree to all manner of crazy things. If you look at them in the eye and say, this is going to be great, you should totally do it, you have no choice. Because um, they do have a choice once the checkbook comes out. If they're a business, ask them for a letter of intent, which is basically a non-binding variant of contract, which says, I'm going to go disappear in the code cave for six months and uh, produce software which is going to do substantially X, Y, and Z. And once I do that, you uh, promise to seriously consider, consider buying it for the sum of $100,000 for the first year. And yes, you can totally put that number on, a, on an LOI, which uh, doesn't is backed by like zero lines of code, if you can establish credibility with the customer that six months from now you're going to have something that delivers on X, Y, and Z. The most important bullet point on the slide is the last one. If you can't get people to say yes, don't build something. Build something else that they will actually enthusiastically try to buy. Let's talk about honing in on who your target customer is. I apologize, but I'm getting over bronchitis, so I'm getting a little bit of dry mouth here. Um, all customers are not created equal. There are people who are great candidates for selling your things to. And by people, I really mean businesses, because you should be selling to businesses. That's where most of the money is. You'll be able to do your best work for them. B2C is a wonderful business model if you're in Silicon Valley and funded, so you can like blow through $10 million of other people's money while you're uh, trying to figure out the model. Um, unless you have $10 million in your back pocket, I wouldn't suggest B2C in 2015 as a self-funded entrepreneur. So you're selling to businesses. but. There's huge varieties of sophistication in businesses, like everything from hair salons to, let's say, multi-billion dollar enterprises. You want to sell to the right selection of businesses in the right industry where you know that you have an in in that industry, that you can identify businesses like that in a scalable fashion, that you can reach the person inside of that business who is able to buy your thing, and that uh, you can actually do work which matters for them on a topic which they know matters for them. And that's really important. Customers won't buy like the things that they need. They buy the things that they know they need. And if you have to cross, cross that need to knowledge of need gap, that will cost you a whole heck of a lot of money in marketing and sales spend. You'll spend years trying to teach the market to um, understand your value proposition, which is wonderful if you have a few million dollars of investor funds to burn uh, while doing that, but less wonderful if you need to pay rent uh, next month when the software is released. So let's talk about channels that work well. And these channels work for anything you're selling, whether it's your time as a W-2 employee, whether it's services agreements, or whether it's uh, software as a service or some other software model. One of the best things that works for me is speaking at events where my target uh, customer type hangs out. You say, well, that's very easy for you, Mr. Keynote Speaker. Um, but how does that work for me, uh, Joe Blow, the Ruby on Rails dev, and dev who has never spoken at a conference before? A, uh, start filling out those like uh, RFP things because there are new speakers at almost every conference and almost every conference organizer will tell you they want new voices on the stage. But B, if you can't uh, speak at an event, like no one will invite you to speak there, throw your own event and then you get to pick the speaker list consisting of you and yourself and nobody else. And this can be done anywhere for any business and it works fantastically. So I've met a few people here who do like Ruby on the intersection of Ruby on Rails and security which is a wonderful field to be in, um, and very needed by the market, oh God. Anyhow, um, all you need to do is say like, okay, I live in Austin, there does not exist a place to learn about the intersection of Ruby on Rails and security in Austin, I will throw the Ruby on Rails security meetup in Austin. And I will go to the VFW hall and pay them a trivial amount of money, like 20 bucks to rent out a room for two hours, and then I'm gonna go to Starbucks and Dunkin' Donuts and pick up some coffee and donuts, and email uh, you know the local uh, local listservs or whatever for folks who uh, in the Ruby on Rails community and say, hey guys, free talk on Friday the whatever uh, after work. 
uh, come listen to a talk for an hour. I'm going to talk about uh, how to perform a security assessment on your Ruby on Rails application. And then uh, after the talk, there will be a little bit of a mixer so you can meet other people who are interested in this. And for 55 minutes of that hour, you do exactly what you, it said on the tin. You just tell people, okay, here's how you perform a Ruby on Rails uh, uh, security assessment of your applications. Here's the classic mistakes. Here's how you verify that that happened or not. Here's how you do the remediation. The last five minutes you say, okay, that sounded like a whole lot of work. By the way, that's the only thing we do. If you're interested, talk to me later. Okay, uh, now everyone gets to mingle for an hour. And I will tell you, because I've spoken at a lot of events, what happens immediately after you get off the stage is everyone will bum rush you and say, oh man, that was totally interesting, but it wasn't specific to exactly my needs. Do you want to talk about exactly my needs? Because I sure do. And you say, oh yeah, totally. Um, it seems like there's a lot of people here. Can I get your card or get your email address and we'll have coffee and talk over this about an, uh, for an hour just for you at leisure. And what you're going to do in that conversation is just qualify them. Like, is this someone I should be working for? Do they have the budget? Do they have the authority to bring me in? If yes, great. You say, this has been an awesome conversation. I think we could do great work together. I will start working on a proposal for you. If you qualify them out at the result of that conversation, like, okay, you just started yesterday. Your company's revenue is $5. You can't really afford a $4,000 uh, Ruby on Rails assessment yet. You say, hey, this has been awesome meeting you. Um, Keep me in, uh, you know, uh, keep in touch. I'd love to uh, give you some informal advice about this at some point. And you just don't offer them the proposal. And you'll, you'll find that if you can get 20 people in a room, and it's easy to get 20 people in a room to talk about anything, that you're going to get five coffee dates out of that and close one to two new engagements, which if you're charging enough for your engagements makes that one hour worth of your time totally worthwhile. Let's talk about getting referrals from other customers. So customers travel in packs. Good customers know other good customers. Bad customers know other good and know other bad customers. This is one of the reasons you want to qualify your customers down to make sure you're doing only your best work for the people who are best capable of um, appreciating it. But when you know that someone is a is the perfect fit for you, uh, you've just and you're at the maximum point of happiness in your relationship with them, which is typically right after you've sold them on using you, you should immediately say, "Hey, this is wonderful." Um, we're going to do excellent work together. I'm so excited about the opportunity to work for, work for you. Before we get started working together, I just have one question. Who do you know in your own personal network at your firm, at somebody else's firm, who would also benefit from uh, this sort of wor work together? And they might ask, well, why do you need to know that? And you say, well, we're all in business here. My business is selling this sort of engagement for people. And it will... Um, uh, if you just uh, you know introduce me to a few of your friends, that will mean I get to spend less time selling more engagements for next month and more time doing the best possible work for you. And people will typically say, "Oh, that sounds fair." All right. Um, you know, I used to work with Bob over at uh, Foosoft. Uh, Bob could totally buy something like this, and you say, "Great." I have an email written. Um, I can just send it to you, and you can uh, forward that language, uh, you know, send that language directly over to Bob, or you can introduce me uh, to Bob in whatever words you think are appropriate. And I will talk to Bob about that. And I'm looking so forward to getting started with you next week. This is one of the highest ROI channels for getting new, new gigs. It costs you nothing except for a few minutes of your time. And by the way, this is one of the asks you can make, which it increases the sales value of your company, but your clients will like getting it. You're positioning them as, hey, I know you're very well connected in the Austin Ruby community. And I know other people trust your judgment. Who'd, who could you do a solid for? by uh, giving them your considered opinion that I am good at this thing that I've just pitched you on. So um, another thing that you can all do, set up an email list via MailChimp, Trip, Customer.io, whatever tool you want to use. There's a million of them these days. And every time you create value somewhere on the internet, you just add a little like thing saying, hey, uh, if you like this, there's more where that came from. If you give me your email list, I will trade it for some specific immediately delivered valuable thing, like maybe... Um, continuing with the Ruby on Rails security thing, maybe like a white paper on the top five vulnerabilities that I found in Ruby on Rails applications over the years and how to fix them. And I'll send you one or two essays a month, which you'll find useful. And then you give people exactly what you promised on the tin. One or two essays a month, which, which you find useful. And whenever you find your pipeline is, uh, your pipeline could use a few more clients in it, or you could use a few more SaaS sales this month, which is uh, basically on every day, which ends in a Y. Um, you uh, mail people and say, hey, uh, it's been great teaching you uh, this, much, uh, this much this month. By the way, uh, I have a little bit of availability coming up, so if you want something which is more specific to your exact needs, just hit reply in this email. It goes directly to me, and let's talk about, uh, you know, we'll book a time to Skype for an hour and talk about exactly what your problem is in your company right now. And then you do the qualification, you, um, and you book them into gigs. Marketing for developers uh, is sort of like this. 
So you do so much work which is really crucial and yet isn't seen by anyone. You can think of like an iceberg. You see only like the tiny little bit that's above the waterline and don't see everything that's below. You need to raise more of your work above the waterline. That's probably the single best thing that open source gives us as developers. Not like, ooh, free code's available all over the internet, but rather the ability to take our professional work, which is previously siloed in organizations that the rest of the world cannot perceive, and put it out there with, where folks could say, wow, this person really does know their stuff. When you do great work for clients, you should aggressively solicit case studies. All you need to do is say on the last day of engagement, this has worked out great. I'm, I'm proud of this work we have done together. I want to give you even more value out of this engagement totally free. You know how you're always trying to uh, write more interesting stuff for your blog? I will write up a, a story of what we just did together, minus all the, con minus the, you know, few con confidential parts, and why that's the, uh, why that's going to produce additional value for your customers. And if they say, yes, you're golden, then you write basically a testimonial for your ability to do great work. You post it on their, uh, their blog. And then every other time a client, uh, a prospect asks you in the future, hey, can you like point to something that says you're capable of doing the work? You're like, yeah, take a look at my clients here. They, uh, they mentioned that we did this great work together and had results X, Y, and Z. Uh, if you want to see an example of this, uh, this case study basically built my consultancy. Uh, it's called uh, Our Marketing is Up Fog Creek, which I did for Fog Creek. Uh, you can Google it and just read that there. Uh, the sub subtleties, and there's not really much subtlety. Um, I asked, hey, can I put in the dollar value that we think this was worth to the company? And they were like, um, we keep that number under our, under our, uh, uh, under our somethings. Um, we don't publicize the, number, uh, the amount of money we make every year. I said, can I just say obliquely that it was a double digit increase in your revenue and uh, percentage increase in your revenue? And they're like, oh yeah, we're cool with that. And so for the next like three years of my consulting career, I was like, by the way, I once did a double digit increase to Fog Creek's revenue. Here's where they talk about it. Actually, it's me talking about it, but it's true. Um, and that got me a lot of additional work with great clients who trust them. Uh, I am running a little bit longer than I thought I would be, so I'm going to blow through some stuff. This is what the sales funnel looks like. And the key thing about sales and marketing is that uh, with each stage of increasing engagement with you, you're going to lose some people. So you're going to want to get good at the transitions between these stages to lose as few people as possible so you get as many as possible down to this magic click getting money from them thing at the end. Uh, money or any other type of value. What you're going to want to do to that is to have repeatable sales processes. So who here like deploys code to production at any point in their jobs? Yeah. Who here does that like totally uh, cowboy style every time where you make it up from scratch as you go along? Right, no hands. Um, you use cap or something, right? Because you want that to work every time you do it. Similarly, when you're doing sales, after you find something that works, you want to reproduce exactly that every time. Like, guess what? Some people are going to say, hey, you're really expensive. You should not, like, just magic up an answer to, hey, I'm really expensive on the fly. You should anticipate that objection and have a canned two sentence answer that you can give for it every time. Like, hey, Patrick, you charge five times as much as any Rails developer we've ever worked with. Yeah, I understand, but I'm not really a Rails developer. I'm the guy who makes software company, uh, software companies more money. Uh, you can see from my list of case studies that I've made clients millions of dollars in additional revenue. So in the context of millions of dollars of additional revenue that we could potentially generate from this engagement, a $60,000 investment is really not that much. Canned can deliver that every time. I probably said that speech a hundred times, and uh, that achieved uh, overcoming the objection quite a lot. One reason why you want to uh, to make these processes repeatable, by the way, because you're going to have to be doing them in parallel with each other. Um, so if you imagine, like, that isn't a pointer, whatever. If you go to the right side and say, this is the the folks I was pushing through the sales funnel like two months ago, and then like work your way left. Okay, last month I was pushing these folks through the funnel. Stuff is starting to like collide with each other. And then this month uh, I'm pushing these folks through the funnel, and now I don't understand what the heck is going on. So if you make your processes repeatable, you can do them. Um, uh, you can do them via pipelining, just like you would pipeline instructions on a processor. If you don't make your processes repeatable and you're like making stuff up as you go along every time, what you're going to end up doing is processing sales serially. And that's the underlying cause of most people's uh, problem in consulting where they have like feast or famine. It's like, okay, I got a gig this month. I'm 100% focused on doing the gig. All right, the gig is done. I'll send them an invoice. And it's going to take me a week to collect the invoice. Okay, I've collected the invoice CA. Now I got to find my next gig. And then they have three weeks of like bubble where they're not working and they're not billing anyone for the work they're not doing. Instead, you want to uh, be having all these things going on continuously. And yeah, it's a lot of work, but uh, uh, you can find uh, numbers and find other 
uh, life advantages that running a consultancy as opposed to being an employee gets you, which makes uh, getting good at this uh, not too, uh, well, very motivational for you in the long run. Uh, most of you in here probably don't need to have a for formal CRM. You can just, uh, uh, but you do need something that's a little more sophisticated than I keep the entire state of my business in my head at uh, once. Just like you wouldn't try to keep the entire memory state of your program in the programmer's head and just expect them to know like what state transition looks like. I just use Trello um, for uh, for sales where I've got a few people in each of the things. This is like actually the legit Trello board for Starfighters. So please don't tweet out those names because we're not live yet. But um, you know, when, I'm, when I have a conversation with someone where it's like, okay, uh, this is not going to result in us working with them, I move them over to the deprioritized and maybe check back in a few months. When I get a letter of intent out of them, I move them uh, towards the right, and then uh, you can see that in my near future, i got to get a lot of contracts signed. And just a simple glance on that lets me know what I need to be doing this week. So uh, last, I want to encourage you to play long ball. Um, I've been doing this for about 10 years after the World of Warcraft as my main professional achievement. And uh, when I started out, nobody knew I, who I was. I was working in obscurity in Kifu Prefecture, which is not exactly uh, a major technology center, <laughs> to put it mildly. And uh, I really knew essentially nothing about anything. But uh, I think that, you know, some of, some of you folks might think, oh, that kind of describes my situation. You know, I don't, I don't feel like uh, I can relate to a $30,000 a week rate. You totally can. It's just the future you. Um, so prior to getting to the future you, you want to work on stuff, uh, work on things where people can see you working. Open source is wonderful for this. Work on things that you can show. Work on things that you can own. Uh, great essay on this is called Stacking the Bricks. It's by Amy Hoy, who I think a lot of you have probably heard about. If you look at the careers of people who are really, really successful, like uh, by any metric of success, like say, I don't know, the 37 Signals crew, base camp crew these days, you think, wow, they're so awesome. It's like a wall of pure awesomeness. And nobody's wall of awesomeness sprang up from nothing. It started like, okay, 10 years ago, nobody knew, knew who they was, but they did like an engagement for a consulting client. Boom, that's a brick. And then they did an engagement for another consulting client. Boom, that's a brick. And then they made a little application that no one had heard about at the time called Basecamp. Boom, that's a brick. And then they extracted a, you know, this quirky like framework built out of an academic language from Japan that nobody used. Boom, that's a brick. Boom, brick, 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 brick. Ten years later, it's a wall. And if you work with intentionality about this sort of stuff, ten years later, it'll be a wall for you. The term of art for this in uh, business is called unfair advantages. And I don't uh, love this word uh, because of the connotations of unfair. So, for example... For Starfighter, um, we have uh, myself and my co-founders have a pretty unfair advantage for starting a technology-based recruiting company uh, relative to any random person in the world. We've already proven out the business model in microscale. We have 15 clients who bought in before the product actually existed. We've got a list of 20,000 engineers who want to play on day one, which BTW probably next week. And our, our founders are kind of internet famous. Um, so you remember that like crack about Hacker News of being being, uh, what was it, Chuck E. Cheese tickets, uh, except located in Mordor. So if that crack is true, then I'm like the Eye of Sauron of Hacker News, and uh, my co-founder is Sauron of Hacker News. We're literally like number one and number two by Karma. Um, you might think, well, that's kind of unfair if you're selling to developers and software companies, but these advantages are not really unfair. They're kind of earned over the course of you know, a long career, like uh, Taken style, right? Liam Nielsen, um, how does he phrase it? Uh, I have accumulated a few very specific skills over the course of a long career, skills that make me really good at launching software products. Um, so I really like talking to folks. Uh, send me an email. This is my best email address, patrick at starfighters with an S dot IO, because the one without an S is not available. Oh, I hate internet domains. Um, Starfighter is going to be launching really soon. If you hire developers or want to get a new job as a developer, it is relevant to your interests. Please get in touch with me. And by the way, little uh, one last tactic that you can steal for all of your talks. Um, so we talked about earlier building a permission email list and getting yourself invited to speak at conferences. You should put your permission email list and say, hey, if you like this talk, you can get more here. So you can get more here. Um, I don't really try to sell anything over that anymore, but I do try to write an essay every couple of uh, months. So uh, if that sounds interesting to you, yeah, mosey on over there. Thanks very much for your uh, time.